Hi everyone, thanks for coming tonight. Tonight we have Ian talking about uh, PySide 6 QT6 and how it allows you to write Python applications that are basically cross-platform, including a graphical user interface. And he, I believe, spent quite a bit of time in the application we're presenting today. So there's a few bits of uh, code involved and quite a few widgets. So it'll be quite interesting not only seeing the application and what it does, but actually looking underneath the hood. And once again, the lead team has been sponsored by the Computing and Mathematical, Mathematical Sciences School here at the University of Waikato. And the Big Blue Button instance has been sponsored by the New Zealand Open Source Society. So, all you see. Thank you. Oh my, okay. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, as you can see, we're going to talk about PySide 6, which is um, given the name QT for Python. And uh, it's a Python wrapper for QT version 6. Um, my presentation tonight, I'll, I'll um, look at GUI toolkits and their Python wrappers, um, a brief history on QT and PySide. Um, I'll then do it what it was involved, the steps for doing the installation of PySide 6 slash QT6. Um, and then I'll review what was installed and which includes some utilities. So I'll show you, show you some of those utilities. And then um, I've written a little program which I've called PySide 6 Assistant. And um, I'll show you how my little program works and uh, do a demo of it. And then I'll show you a few little highlights of my code or what do I call bugs um, and why they you can maybe work out why they don't, why I've got bugs or how to fix them or something. Okay, so let's get started. Um, probably the three main GUI toolkits, well, definitely for the Linux platform, uh, um, the TK slash TCL, which is written in the C language, and it's still alive and well, and they keep putting out new releases, and it's at 8.6. Um, although I guess they're pretty minor releases that come out. And the name of the Python binding for this is Tekinta. And we also have GTK, which is again written in C, and it's up to GTK4. Um, and it's part of the Pi Object Introspection repository, I think it is. And uh, uh, you, from that repository, you import GTK4 to. Uh, get your widgets and other things like that. Um, and what we're on to tonight is QT, which is written in C++. It's currently at version 6.4 as of about a week ago. And there have been uh, two sets of bindings. One is called PyQT6, which is um, from Riverbank Computing. And the other one is PySide6, which is from the QT company. So tonight we're going to look more specifically at number two, PySite 6 from the QT company. Um, a quick look at QT history. They started about 30 years ago. Um, these two chaps, who I believe were from Norway, they started writing QT. And then they founded, uh, three years later, Trolltech. And uh, ten, by 2006, there was an IPO of, to of Trolltech. And... Uh, a couple of years later, Nokia Corporation acquired Trolltech. Um, Trolltech was renamed QT Software, and in 2009, renamed QT Development Frameworks. And then a bit later, Nokia sold to Digia, and Digia, Digia later formed a QT company, um, which is a wholly owned subsidiary. And the QT company went public with NASDAQ. Helsinki uh, in 2016. So, when did that, they uh, drop the non commercial license restriction? Remember when KDE was starting? Sorry, oh, yes. when KDE was starting in the late 90s. Right. And they, were, they decided to use QT as the foundation classes. Uh, the Free Software Foundation objected hmm. because of the licensing restrictions at the time, which were later resolved. That's why GTK. Started yeah. on different track. Yeah, yeah. I think there was a boost of going towards GTK around 2008 with the Nokia Corporation and that sort of thing. Um, but I'm not sure when it when 
um, when it, things change. Anyway, the, the headquarters now are in Finland and they claim about 450 employees worldwide and their website is the QTIO, um, the repository, the github.com, uh, QT is, is there. I admit they don't actually have the Pi side code at that repository, but um, perhaps they've got a, another, another github.com for the Pi side code. Um, just to go through the Pi side history, I, I don't know the actual date when Riverbank Computing started putting a wrap around QT, but I think it was quite a bit before it, uh, before 2009. But um, in the initial release of um, PySide from QT was in 2009. And apparently, Side is finished for binding, so that's a, basically a QT binding. Um, what have we got? 12th of September was when PySide 6, which is at version 6.3.2, became available on um, PyPy. And uh, PySide supports Linux, Mac OS, and Windows. PySide, um, without any numbers after it, supports Qt4. Um, and then in 2015, there was a PySide 2 that came out to support Qt5. And then 2020 was the release of PySide 6 to support Qt6. And um, you must have Python 3.6 or better for, for using PySide 6. And PySide is being marketed these days as the Qt for Python. Um, and at uh, Qt's website now, they actually have a Qt for Python um, documentation and um, tutorials there. Uh, in the past, you would go to Qt's website and you'd have to read C++ code and then work out how to convert it to Python. So that was the sort of um, level of help you got. But uh, now there's quite a bit more. Uh, well, there's a whole section just on Qt for Python. So coming back to Lawrence's question, um, so I was just looking up on Wikipedia. So in 2000, Qt 2.2 was released under GPL2. So that ended finally so sort of the controversy. But the Windows side of things was not yet and there was, I think, according to the article here, um, there was with QT4 that it was also on the GPL um, that finally released for Windows. So that was basically the same across all platforms, which you have with QT4. Uh, there's also Riverbank Computing, I think, were initially approached to provide the wrapper from Python Ransom wrapper, and um, they've got a, a, a commercial licensing issue and they wouldn't change it. And so hence that was gated QT, the company, to go ahead and make their own wrapper, I believe. So I'm not sure when that all happened. But, uh, so I, I think the trend now is you're going to see Riverbank computing sort of fade off into the sunset. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, <clears throat> Everything should be become from the Qt company. I see here yeah, there's a VPN package called Qt Pi. Have you heard of this one? And it's a small abstraction layer which works to put either PyQt or PySub. And it mentions here PyQt5, PyQt6, PySub2, PySub6. <laughs> a wrapper of a wrapper. A wrapper of a couple of wrappers. Okay. Yeah. Um, Anyway, yes, yeah, carrying on. Um, installation. Here's a few um, snapshots I did when I did the install. Um, so if we, we take a look at um, what you get on Ubuntu 2204 and do a search for PySide 6, then there's nothing in the repository. You can try PySide 5, but there never was anything. PySide 2 is still there, so um, you could probably do a standard APT install um, of PySide 2 and use Qt5 bindings if you wanted to. Um, so they're running a bit behind the, the eight ball. Um, if you go to Manjaro KDE, then um, when you install it, you'll find that in your user lib, what is it, user lib Python 3.10 site packages, PySide 6. Um, 
So, so yeah, it's already been installed. You know, it comes with the, the KDE distro. And, um, but the thing is, um, when you look at what modules have been installed, there's about 24 out of 46. So it's sort of all the, all the main ones, I guess, are installed, but you haven't got the whole lot um, in installed. But you can go into there. Is it Pac-Man? Is that the little Pac-Man logo? Whatever the installer is. And you, I think you click on dependencies, and that allows you to install uh, the missing modules. So you can um, you can do it from there. Uh, you know, do it from the standard user lib um, repository. Um, if you go to um, PyPy, then you'll see that there's a PySide 6.3.2 and 12th of September it was installed. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see when it upgrades to 6.4 because QT just did that about a week ago. So I'm not sure how far behind um, they, they can do that. One of the things of the GTK is because it uses uh, the integrated repository, theoretically, it's an automated process. To, so if, if, they, if the C code changes, then they can produce the Python uh, libraries pretty quick. I don't know how quick these guys are. Um, anyway, so for, for my case on an Ubuntu system, I decided to put in um, PySo 6 in a virtual environment. So this is just a screenshot showing um, installing. The necessary bits to get uh, uh, be able to set up a virtual environment, and here Python three minus m virtual environment, um, and I create my virtual environment, which um, puts pip and a few things in, and then um, here we go putting in PySide six. So pip install PySide six, and uh, what have we got? About 76 megabytes there, 120 megabytes there. So maybe 200 megabytes of uh, code to put in. Yeah. I've never really worked out what she broken. She broken? She, she's broken? <laughs> There's a bindings generator for C libraries that offers C Python source code. <laughs> okay. So create for C. Okay. Yeah. QT actually uses some kind of Extended C++, they got their own preprocessor. Oh, okay. Because it defines uh, signals and soft listeners kind mm -hmm. of thing, which cannot be expressed conveniently in straight C++, so they have their own, mm -hmm. or they used to, I don't know how we call that. Yeah. Okay, not a bad name. Huh? Um, okay, so I've installed it, so I do a little quick check of the version, and I find I'm running 6.3.2, and then I make myself a little working directory, which I call PySci 6. So I'm all ready to go. And if we now take a look at what's been down unloaded, so we have our PySide 6 library containing 46 Python modules and, um, well, QT Python modules. Uh, we get help from all those modules, classes, and the class attributes. Um, there's an icon library there that we can tap into. Um, there's also example programs for Python slash PySide 6. Um, and if you look at them, many of them have been stolen from, uh, uh, no, I don't know if they've been stolen from GTK. <laughs> but um, no, I think that they've just been upgraded over the years. Um, There's and, a lot of cooperation, I think, you know, but mm -hmm. we just stop thing. They, they try to support, they don't want to take sides, GTK, yeah. or whatever. Okay, so then you also get some utilities get um, added to you, um, can be operated from the uh, command prompt, um, and they include PySide 6 Designer, which uses a thing called the User Interface Loader, and there's uh, PySide 6 UIC, which is a User Interface Compiler, and there's also the RCC, which is a Resource Compiler. It'll, um, like, images you might want, um, it will put them into a, a Python file uh, as um, um, bytecode. Uh, there's also more, but those, I'll cover those three. I'll cover all that above tonight. So if you go to the um, the library, um, oh, let's just look at some naming conventions. PySide 6 is the library, and then 
If it's a QT, then it means it's the prefix for a module. So QT widgets is the module that contains most of the um, widgets available. So you find push buttons and things, classes under that. Uh, if it just starts with a Q, then um, it's a prefix for a class. So um, Q push button is, is, is one of the classes available. And the attributes, it normally uses the lower camel, camel case um, style. So it'll have like dot set and then a capital T for text. Okay, so that's what you kind of want to get used, got to get used to. Dromedary camel text. You know your dromedary and Bactrian camel. Uh -huh. Bactrian camels are two humps. So when it begins with a capital, that's that's another hump. So uh -huh. One dromedary is a hump in the middle. So yeah, it begins with lower case. Yeah. Okay. So they always go for the after the dot. There's a, a, a lowercase um, word. Um, if we look at um, into our virtual environment, we've got uh, um, Python 3.10 site packages, by site include, and these are all the um, folders. So I think there's 46 Qt modules. So all the classes would be residing off those folders. I don't know why they sit in there. Stuff get compiled. Well, you can go to the the thing. Sometimes Python extension modules allow you to build other extension modules that look into them. Mm. So that could be what that's Yeah. Okay. Um, so if you wonder, you can start writing a program. So you can just open an editor and you can, um, the standard um, importing method would be to to go from PySide 6 .qt core import qt size, a couple of classes there, or from the widgets, bring in those three classes. And then down the bottom, this is your standard little launch code where um, you use QApp, the application these days. And uh, uh, then app.execute is what maintains the loop. There's, there's no um, main loop with that. GTK used to use main loop. Um, they all have main loops. Now, what about... But you don't have to write it. Type it in. And Did then, you come across any mention of async .io support? No. Oh, I think there was a module, yeah. I think there's, oh, okay. there's a Q async .io, I think. Yeah. Because, yeah, because it, I think previously when I first looked at this, mm -hmm. there was a, another Python module which built on top of Qt, put into the Qt event loop to make it async .io. Mm -hmm. So in this case, we'd go up here and... Um, launch um, a main window and set it up as my app and it would add a button to it with press me on it and um, set up the size of the button Quash. Quash. And make a, a, a connection to the socket so um, we're going to have a when, when the button's pushed it will call the button was clicked um, which um, and then we've got to attach the button to the um, the main window. Um, so down here when the button is clicked it, it'll, it'll just print to the console the word clicked. So so you can get going just straight away like that. And here's my little application. I click on press me and on the console we get click, 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 click and you don't push it. Um, well, what was gonna, was something I was going to mention about that. Um, One thing, the Python oh. syntax for calling the super in it there's nothing cleaner than that. You've got to call the whole redundant method directly. Yeah. You would have thought that was kind of a. Yeah, it's always. Yeah. Um, it used to be worse in all the versions. What? Because you had to specify the class as well. Okay, was it all star classes? Because yeah, it was all star classes. This is much, much better. Not great, but better. Um, one other thing I was going to mention is. Here I make a window and I put a button in the window. All, all the widgets can just be um, run without a window. So I could just say, instead of having all this window code here, I could just have called um, Q button, uh, you know, well, uh, Q push button, and, and, and Q push button would become uh, the window. <laughs> yeah. So you would have a floating button? Yeah, yeah. All right. yeah um, which is quite good if you want to just test out a widget, I suppose. You can just, in yeah. fact, when you look through the example code, if you Google example code, then you'll find um, 
quite a lot of the code. There's no create a main window and put the widget in it. People just write a bit of code that just you know launches a widget and uh, does something. Yeah. In, so, in X11 and I think in Microsoft Windows as well, every widget is its own window. It's its own yeah. window. Yeah. So your windows within windows. Uh, and nothing about this is there's no explicit tying to the app object. It's all implicit. You don't tell it what the app object is that's going to be managing all these widgets. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It just happens. Yep. But that, that app, Q application thing, I think I think is new. And there used to be a thing where you went app.exec and it was underscores brackets. That's the Pi side 5. Pi side 6, they've got rid of the underscore before these brackets down here. Anyway, um, moving on. Um, okay, so we've got a little app and we check this one. Um, what are we looking at here? Oh, PySide comes with, with standard like um, help, uh, Python help utility or whatever. And uh, so if I go from PySide six widgets import Q push button, I can do help Q push button. And it will display help, which I I assume that that's been taken from C++. Those are, those are Python type annotations. Yeah, I presume they're automatically generated, but those are valid Python annotations. Uh -huh. Those are Python annotations. And one thing you might notice is the ability to put square brackets to index on a type. And that was added specifically to Python for use in type annotations in 3.8 or 3.9, something very fairly recent. Uh -huh. That thing. So you can see that types. So those are all Python type annotations, and those are nice. So those are. Right. I think those are generated from C++ code. So there's normally help for um, well, there's help for the module, help for the class, and also normally all um, uh, attributes have a, have a help. But um, there's not normally a lot of description in the in the attribute help. But um, so anyway, we'll move on. So that's something else that's bundled in there. Um, I mentioned you get a bunch of, I think you get 80, 80 icons are supplied that you can go ahead and use. I've just shown about 20 there. Um, and if you search through the, what you've downloaded, you don't actually find any .ico files. You don't, they don't, they're not there. SVG? Not. Well, um, I think it's all embedded in one big image or something. Because I think a lot of the free desktop stuff, they're moving the scalable icons, the SVG. Yeah. Mm. Oh, yeah, but I don't, oh, I think I, did I, okay. I mean, that can also be embedded in the library. Mm. But this is how you see you use get attributes, oh, widgets, queue size, mm. standard picks map, and, and then you put in the name that's associated that you want. Okay. And then it, it, it's a, a picks mappy it gets. And then you say that you want that as a standard icon, and then you you throw it at the window. You know? So that would make the icon that sits in the system tray when you launch your application. You get me? If you, if you once upon a time, I thought all applications was trendy to have on the top left hand corner of the of the header bar to have a an icon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, is that still I done? Still, I still do that, but I'm old fashioned. <laughs> um, the apps I'm running here have exactly that. Because I, 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 that's what I was expecting when I went to set, um, set window icon. I was expecting that to places on the top left hand corner as you well as. Up, up to the window manager. Yeah, it's usually in the task bar when you see that. Yeah. But it's of a, it depends on your window manager whether you ah, can see it there as well. Because yeah. it's in the window yeah. title bar here. And that's up to the manager. Uh, so because KDE puts it up there. Mm -hmm. okay. you're, you're normal, anyway, that, that definitely sticks it down in the, in the task, is it taskbar? Um, okay, and the other thing you get thrown in with it is these example programs, and they're all in um, a bunch of uh, folders, right, based on category. And uh, that's where I thought there was an async one here. All right. Anyway, um, and it's quite a long path to find an example, but if you if you go right down this long path, you'll get to something like Simple 3D, which is in this 3D path up here. And when you launch it, um, it makes that 
little well, the the ring and the ball goes round and round the ring with a little bit of three D animation. So um, I think there's about two hundred plus sample programs there that you can use. I wouldn't say they all work, um, and there's a few tricks to get some of them to work. You'll have to add import other modules. Um, yeah, so there, there I install matplotlib, OpenCV Python, NumPy, uh, PyOpenGL, Pandas. Those were some of the ones that I, well, they were the ones I put in to get some of them to work. Um, I also... Actually, all of those are available as standard packages. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it, they weren't necessarily installed on my computer. So in, in the virtual environment, I just sort of put in the, I pick them and put them in. Um, and if you create the virtual environment, you have the option to sublink in all the standard packages as well. Mm -hmm. Sublink or copy. Okay. Um, uh, later on, you'll see a bit of code that I use and in order to, that I wrote rather, and then um, in order to make it work, I had to install pigments. Um, so that's something you might need to put in. Um, I said there were some utilities that were uh, installed. So this is, if you just type PySide 6 and then tab, you get this list of about 12, is it, programs. Um, PySide 6 Designer may interest you. It's uh, a GUI tool for, for creating uh, windows and with widgets on them. Um, so we'll, we'll look at that. Um, over here, we've got PySide 6 UIC, which will take the uh, XML file that Designer creates and convert it into a um, user interface file, a Python file that um, you can then uh, get your, launch your program and call that file and it will launch the window that you've created with Designer. And there's another one, RCC, which is Resource Compiler. And that's where, let's say you've got six little images you want to add uh, to your program, then rather than have them called image one, image two, whatever, and bring them in, you can just put them all in a resource file and that they're all in there as, um, uh, what is it called, um, like base64 uh, bytecode, I think. So you can uh, install them there. Um, I don't, yeah, the other little utility that I haven't really played with. Um, okay, so here's a little look at, at Designer. Oh, well, no, it should be called, um, yeah, Designer, yes. Um, here I just uh, said, give me a main window and then I put a um, vertical layout box, there's a red line around it, and then I drag and drop a push button, a, um, uh, what's the next one, combo box, and then um, I stuck a spring in there. Um, it's called a vertical spacer in there, and then we, I put a, a progress bar. So it's a pretty uh, pointless little thing, but um, it just shows you some, some widgets being added to the main window. This and the PP designer, because there's already a PP designer. And is there something Python specific in the PySign 6 designer? Well, yeah, if you go over, uh, we can demonstrate it live, but um, I'm pretty sure if, if, if you go to is it uh, view and, and click on that and it says do you want to look at your python code so if i go to the next screen that's the python code that qt designer generated i thought it generated xml yeah it does but you can you get a choice do you want to look at the xml or do you want to look at um the python code that that the uic um converter would um would generate i guess so it's using, it's using the u prefix which is um Python 2 compatibility thing for Unicode strings. Ah, oh, okay. Okay. Um, what was I going to say? Yeah, so, that, so what you could do is you could just chuck a bunch of widgets on the screen and then come and look at this code and, and cut and paste what you want into your, if you're writing it in a, um, uh, you know, an IDE, you could just throw it into the IDE. And, and not save this project is what you Yeah, yeah, just, you know. You know, if you just if you're a bit unfamiliar with how things you know with what the name of the widget is or whatever then it could be a quicker way to write your code um if we if we save the file 
that um, that I created, which uh, I, I created test underscore one dot UI is, is what the designer would save it as. And that is looking at the first bit of it and it's an XML file and, you know, it starts by getting um, a Q main window and setting its width and height and, and off it goes and be adding the, oh, there's the vertical layout widget. If we went further down, there'll be the push button and things get added to it. So that's the, the XML code. And then if you write a, a little program like this, this will um, use from QT UI tools, it'll use the QUI loader and it will load my test1.ui. Okay, and um, then on my screen, I will see my main window at, what did I say, 600, 800 by 600, and my push button, my combo box, and my um, my progress bar. Okay, so that's that's sort of one way of, of uh, running code. And um, this is an alternative method where we we run the um, the PySide 6 UIC utility and we feed it the um, UI XML code and we output UI test one pi. And this looks a bit like that help that you saw before in the designer. I don't think it's identical actually. Um, and it creates UI underscore test one dot pi. Subclassing from object again, that's the part that you do things. So is this all still compatible with Python 2 in some way, or is it just... Well, you're only supposed to use <laughs> Python 3.6 and better. Mm -hmm. So I don't, think, I don't think you need to... Um, I don't think it would run with that. Anyway, um, moving on. Um, so yeah, I write a little piece of code like this, and when the window gets launched, then self.ui is that UI main window, which I... From UI test one dot test underscore one dot pi, I import UI main window, and that's um, that's the other way of, of getting the code up and running. And and you see over here, it's launched my main window with a push button, and, uh, progress bar, and combo box and stuff. Okay, so either way, you, know, you can do it. Um, for documentation, I am using UI files from Designer or, or Qt Creator with um, QUI Loader or the PySide 6 UIC. There's pretty good documentation um, from the Qt company. And I found this Python GUIs uh, com has also got some fairly good documentation there. So um, yeah, that can help you get going. Um, here's a little look at this resource compiler I've been talking about. You write a, um, a resource file like this, which is sort of what, is that pseudo, pseudo XML or something. Um, I call it the, pull, the, the file is called ball.qrc. Um, it, I'm, I'm my, in my default directory, I have a, a ball.png file picture of a ball with a little ring, which you saw before actually. And um, so I go pi side RCC and then uh, ball QRC and it outputs a Python uh, file called RC underscore ball dot pi. And if I um, have a look at that, that Python file that's created, it starts with a few comments and um, from PySide import QT, and then it starts doing um, bytecode there and carries on as about 40 KB just for this one image. Um, if there were more images, I would just put, you know, file and I put another image so I could have, you know, five or six images there if I wanted to, and they would all be in this um, rcball.py file. Would they be in one byte stream? No, they, it sort of breaks it. You can, you can look through and sort of see how many images are there by the by the, the breaks in the in the um, binary code? So you, you kind of well actually the images is above that, and so most of it's missing. But then this is um, this is what most of the byte code looks like um, for for your resources. Doesn't use triple coded strings. <laughs> mm. Single coded strings. Yeah. 
Oh, and backslash is on the. Yeah, it could use implicit concatenation. You know how you put two string symbols next to each other, and they're one. They're treated as one. There was a YouTube video where one guy said this is a easy mistake to make with that, but I thought it's very useful. Okay, I've gotten a comma every now and then, but most of the time it's quite useful. Okay. Um, uh, here's an example. So, on uh, my um, when I go to launch my program, I'm, I'm using that UI test one import UI main window you saw before, and I also do an import of RC ball. And um, my code, all I need to do is, um, in this case, I'm treating it as like CSS background image URL, and then the must be the colon knows to go and look in the resource file, and then ball.png, and uh, um, sure enough, when I when I now run my program, um, it's got the push button and combo box. It's got the same things here, but it's added this image, which uh, there in, into the background of my main window, which you got that from the resource file. So I think that's pretty close to it for um, what you what you get for your money um, when you put put things in. Um, so at this point, perhaps. If anyone's got any questions, it'd be a good time. Otherwise, I'll move on and, and do a little look at my, um, um, my next presentation, which is a little program that I've written to um, try and get as much info out, out, of, out of QT as you can with only a few mouse clicks. So I've called it PySide 6 Assistant dot Py um, is the name of my little program, and um, so the program provides help based on a tree selection method. Plus, you also get help on a search string method. Um, and when you've got this help, because it could be so extensive, um, you know, could be a lot of data. Um, I provide a way to search through the help forward and backwards and in have case sensitive selection. Um, I display all the icons that are, dis that are supplied so you can take a look through and pick which icon you might want to use. Um, I also search through the Python example programs and display um, um, uh, code lines either side of a map. So if you've got something that might be dot index, then it will look through all the example programs and find any uh, cases where there's a line of Python code that, that goes dot index, okay? Um, and at the same time, when you've looked at that bit of code, if you decide you want to see some more, you can click on a link and it will display the whole, um, that whole Python program. And there's a tree to select an example program and to run it. And um, at the same time, you can display the, the example Python programs code, or in fact that already happens. You can look at the code that it's running. And um, I also list all files in the example programs directory. So you can you might see resource files in there that you want might want to have a look at or something. So let's see how this how you can make all that into one program. Um, so this is the what it looks like when you launch it. Um, and um, I put a, this is all my just welcome information here that's um, explaining the, the different utilities that are available, um, these are the versions available, and then down here is all the, the modules that are installed. Um, and then I think if, actually if we go to the next window, um, it'll explain things. So over here we've got the tree selection help where you click on uh, open up the tree and go down the branches and click on that and then it will be displayed in, on the here in the help information. Um, you can also do a search help where you type something in and it will be displayed. You, you look through the list, click on it and it will be display here. Um, when you've got all this information here, this I actually used the status bar and just started poking widgets into the status bar. So along the bottom of the screen, we've got this search info, and um, it, you can search through what's being displayed in the help information. 
We can view the icons available. Um, we can search um, through the example code uh, <clears throat> to find uh, a, a particular um, attribute or something that you're after in the example code. And over here, this little um, uh, window is um, where you can run any, any of the example code programs. And when you're running them, you can come over here and click this um, Python code up the very top, this other tab here, and it will display the, um, the code that's actually running. Okay. Um, one thing is this, uh, these panels here are all, uh, what are they called? Uh, sliders, switches. Yeah, anyway, uh, they're all movable. You can you can stretch them you can stretch them this way and down. I'll demonstrate it later. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So let's just look at them um, using the tree selection. I click on Qt Core. I come down. I click on Qt Calendar, and then I select an attribute called Day of the Week. And over here in my help, the help information, the the top two lines. This shows what I've clicked on. So Core Calendar Day of the Week, and um, this is a suggested way that if you're going to import and use this day of the week feature, then your import statement would be like that. And you have to go and put that up on top of your program. Um, the help for day of the week is rather limited. Um, it's just, that's it. Um, so I put the help for day of the week plus I, the next level above. So I put the help for um, QT calendar as well. You don't seem to believe in what strings. Classes never seem to have dog strings, even in methods. Yeah. Um, and in the little corner, I've given an example of running if you were going to um, run uh, a little, write a little program. So you would use this from PySide QT Core import calendar, plus I've imported Q, Q date and instantiate uh, the calendar. And then calendar dot day of the week, and if I put today's date, then it comes back with a one to be Monday. So that's one way of using your um, using the tree selection. And then the other one I said is is the search selection. So let's say I know or think or hope that there's something called date two, and it displays that um, there's various different things that have date two. And the one I'm interested in is using Q date, and I want to do date to string. Okay, and um, so again, this would be the way I'd import it, and this is the help I get on um, uh, using Q date, and this is, oh, sorry, the help on Q date to string, and this is the help on the class Q date. And again, I've written a little bit of program code where I uh, say to date is today's date and then date to string in that format returns 10th of October 2022. No, that, that doesn't happen automatically. That was just added by me as example. Okay. Um, when you get all this help, uh, along the bottom, this, this little thing blowing up here, which says a uh, case sensitive of one of 12 matches. There's a, you can search through your help information. So you can put in days and, and then there's, um, here's my, down here, my, my search for days and I can uh, down arrow or up arrow it to search through it. I can uh, determine whether it's case sensitive so I could get rid of capital D's and just look for lowercase days. But um, there's 12 matches there. So that can help you look through the information, the help information that's provided. Um, moving on, the next one along the bottom. By 12 matches, did it mean it was showing 12 methods in the previous one? Well, no, you see the next, there'll be a match there. Be, if, if I click the matches that would go one, it would hop to there, hop to there, hop to there. So, uh, yeah. because, okay, the next function, there's no days anywhere in there. Yeah, so, oh, but that might go on for, it could be you know, 10,000 lines of code <laughs> help. <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah, so it will jump, jump, well, no, maybe not 10, it could be 10,000 bytes. 
So this is moment. just sort of like text search in a yeah. large piece of text. Okay, because those are meta definitions. So it's searching the source code. So the body of the function could that have further matches in it? Is that what it is? Uh, no, because I get help on two string and I get help on queue date. This queue date could be ten thousand bytes of help information, whereas uh, the help on the method is is normally only about that, like you know, six or eight lines. Okay, so when it comes to looking through this, you can be swamped with data. So so by putting a, a help, it's to more to help you get through queue date. If two string didn't suit your needs, then trying to find something else that, that might suit your needs. Is, is where you'll find it in queue date. So, so that's the idea of, um, of having this search forward and reverse through things. Okay, so moving on, we've got the next icon along is um, uh, icon view. And um, uh, it, it comes with a little intro I wrote. So QT icon, you know, includes icons that may be made use of. They are acquired from QT widgets, Q style, standard, PixMap, um, their names start with the letters SP. And um, for example, to add the QT icon so that it shows in the system tray, um, that's the code you, you would use. Why do you need, because get adder is a built in Python function. So you could just use that name as a Python identifier QT widgets dot Q style dot standard mix map dot SP underscore title dot mini button. That would be valid Python, wouldn't it? You don't think you need the get adder if it's present, otherwise. You get none, but it doesn't specify the default for the attribute, so it's going to get the attribute error anyway. Oh, okay, true. Yeah, you know, it could be like if the name of the thing was not a valid Python identifier, mm -hmm. that could have trouble. Otherwise, you don't need to use get address. Right, it would be valid. Yeah, I miss that's not my code, I just copied that. So, <laughs> automatically generated. Okay, yeah. oh no, I don't know. That was the example I had, that's how somebody had. Yeah. Um, and then these are the 80 uh, or so icons that you, you've got available and, and the names that they have. Although down here, I don't know what happened to Vista, but Vista's yeah. blank. <laughs> this is the one SP title bar menu button. It puts the little QT uh, logo in things. Um, so I think m most of you, oh, there's somewhere here, there's nothing, you know, no icon. Being supplied. What's, what's this the shield supposed to be? Do you know? <laughs> I don't know. The, the one that's missing in the bottom right. Yeah. Uh, what's it supposed to be? But maybe if I'd installed this on Windows, maybe it would show up. This mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so, so I I flogged the up arrow and down arrow in that you know that previous example. I've got those two icons uh, are used. Um, and, and the little, see there's a little cleaner to clean, to sweep clean your field, a you know, little brush. But, but when I installed the search, there's actually a search text button or something, uh, a widget. The, 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 yeah, I forget what, but, and it comes with the brush included. So you don't actually have to add, add the icon. It's uh, included there. Um, I'll just, oops, where is it? So you see the little brush down here? Um, yeah, it's not, there's a line edit and then there's a search line edit or something. Search line edit adds the button. Okay. There's a built-in reset, what you see. Built-in. Yeah, it just clears that field. Um, now, what was it? All right, the next, the next item, the next little field along there is on the bottom row is search in Python code. So here I've said, okay, dot index. I want to find any bit of code that has dot index in it. And it looks through the 200 or so Python programs, example programs, and it finds dot index um, exists in the charts nested donuts program. And um, so I display it on the fifth line down, I think it is. One, two, three. Yeah. So so here's here's the match that it found in that particular program. And so I display a little bit before and a little bit after. And if that's not adequate, you see there's 28 more snippets of code you can look through. Each one's only about 10 lines, it's 10 lines displayed. But um, 
if it, or if you're more interested in this, you can click on this Charts Nested Donuts um, link, and it will open a window and it will display um, that actual piece of code. So you can see how they import things and how they launch the win widget. And if we look down towards the end of the code, here was the, the match that I found. Okay, so maybe you looking through the whole program, example program might be more handy for helping you out. You, uh, you see the angles are in degrees. My, my, my pet peeve about angles is that um, the underlying should always be in radians. But they should provide, you know how Python provides the radians and degrees function? Quite a lot of languages do that, Java as well. Mm -hmm. But you need two functions for every unit. So my idea is you have just a single multiply constant. So for example, degrees. If you say 90 times degrees, the result is radians. So if, if you do if you do a, like an arc sign which will return a radians, you divide it by the degrees multiplier and that gives you degrees. So one constant for each unit. You know, rather than two functions converting back and forth, uh -huh. that's the best way. So it says 360 times degrees, 90 times degrees, whatever, then you know it's in degrees. Okay. Um, yeah, there may be thing two radians and two degrees or something like that. Because um... another convenient unit is whole circles. Uh -huh. You know, 0 0.25 times circle, for example, for, for a rectangle. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, so the the fact that you only need one multiplier for each unit, it's easier to have lots of units. Mm -hmm. If you need two functions for each one, then it multiplies a bit more. Okay. Um, and then another section we've got in the um, in the, my little program is um, tree selection to um, run an example program. So these are the categories of, uh, of um, example programs that are there. And over here I've clicked on charts and I've said I want an area chart. And once I click on that, then it will launch this little um, example here and which is called Batman. So, um, uh, and at the same time that, um, that, that well, or, or shortly after actually, I'll explain that later, but um, as well as <coughs> having this, <coughs> sorry, this Python program running, um, we also can switch to Python code on our, our main window. And um, so this is areachart.py and that's the, the path to it. And it starts with a copyright thing, which goes on for about 40 things. And then we get the, um, the, the Python code that was used to run it. And in some cases there may be um, other information or even more Pi programs in there. So um, at the end of that, uh, um, displaying the code, I um, I give a list of what files are in the area chart. So that's the one that we just looked at there. Um, there's some documentation, there's a picture, um, there's a uh, set of list for... Um, restructured text. Restructured, yeah, that's right. Um, so, yeah, if, if there was help information in there, you might want to dig in there and go and read it if you were interested in the code. Um, Here's an example of something a bit more complicated. So it's got um, a an image in there. It, it, it's got a form.ui, and then someone must have used uh, PySide 6 UIC and made a UI form.py. Um, so that could have been created on um, a designer. Uh, Any examples of ACL at all? Well, we we'll, can try looking later. I thought I stumbled on something before. Yeah. I mean, yeah, when I was mucking around, huh? but I have to go and look. Um, another thing that you, you could find in there is, in this case, I found states.rc. So I guess there was a states uh, image, PNG image, and that got converted to uh, using uh, PySide 6 RCC. It got converted to states underscore RC. You got Py to use that. So which is just some other some other thing. So I think that's pretty close to everything the little program will do. Um, so I guess I could 
try and prove I'm not lying and give a demo and see if it works. Um, and then I can show you some things that I didn't get to work. Um, oh, where was it? Here? Yeah. So let's, let's start, or start up running. Um, yeah, I can't actually make it zoom out any bigger than that. Just because you set it to 800 or 600, is that what? Is that readable? Yeah. Can, can people, can, is David still there or something? Can he confirm if it's readable? Just about. Just about, yeah. So I can zoom some other things, I'll show you that. Okay, oh well, I'll, is it worth, no, I won't, I'll, I'll just I'll carry on. Yeah. Um, okay, so over here, let's say we go QT Core, um, no, that's um, 3D. Yeah. Let's go QT Core and we could slide down and we could find, say, um, there's lots of them, um, ABC, okay, there's QT Date that I showed before. So if we click, what was it? Um, long string, two string. Uh, what did I have before? Days of the. Uh, Something that formatted it, isn't it? Uh, I can't remember, but anyway, if we click on day of the week, oh, it was day of the week. Yeah, was my example. So that over here now we've got um, the import statement that you might want to cut and paste, and then here's the on the the method is. Um, uh, for day of the week, and then going up a level, the class QT date, and it goes. See, this could be quite a bit of code. You scroll down. So that's where I can put in, say, something like days, and that's what we saw before. But it's going to jump through these. You've got days in a month, days in a year, days two, add days. Right, so. Oh, and then it goes around again. And it, it has got case sensitive selection. So before, if it's any old days, then um, it's 12, but if it's got to be lower case D, then it's uh, only 10 matches. And I'm have to, I guess if I make it an uppercase, it should find two. So, yeah, it's really good. Um, so, okay, so that's one way of searching for things. Over here, if once you get up to four characters, oops, um, index. There's quite a lot of things that have index. What was the one I was demonstrating? Uh, push button, was it? Mm. It's donut, donut charts. It was, it was looking for a donut. Ah, uh, yeah. Donut charts, yeah. Um, but, but let, let's just say you want to find um, Q. All right, if I go T O N dot um, button, um, no, there's no button index. Um, what's something a button has? Donut, D O N U T. D O N U T. That was the one that we showed before. Yeah. No, but that was an example, wasn't it? That, that was, was a specific the, example that you yeah. had before. Let's say I want to do something with push button fonts, but down here I would have to go to to do this selection. I have to have to go. Um, let's close that all up. I have to go down to Q, QT widgets, and then I'd have to go to Q push button. This is a fair bit of scrolling. What is it? Q push button, and then. These are my, mostly met the methods available. Um, but but over here, if I figure that they're going to use the word button and and I want well, I wasn't no, I wasn't for fonts. So so it can it can scan across a boundary if you is that what it, is it, if you understand? It'll search across a boundary. So this is what I can find out about um, push button fonts and um, and meanwhile, this is what I can also find out about, about um, push button itself. Okay, so that's those two. And then, um, where do we go? Um, we've seen that one. And then icon view is here. So that's what you saw in the slide, pretty much. Um, there are, I, I stumbled across it only this afternoon, and I haven't investigated. 
there are a whole lot of other files. Instead of starting with SP, they start with um, other letters, and I, I possibly they are graphic images that because I can't find here. For, ones, they need like SV or SVG or something. Like that. No, I think you see, I don't see in here. If you were doing a word processor, I don't see you know um, left justify, right justify, left align, right align. Yeah, but left align, right align. But you, I don't see any of that. That um, these are kind of generic. Yeah, so but I think they may be in another set. So perhaps I need to look a bit more um, for them. Uh, okay, so that's there. And then okay, down here we can search this in Python code. So that's what I did. I index. Okay, and there's 29 matches. So if I go over here to Python code, here was my nested donuts, right? So so um, that's the first example, and there's lots more in, in other, some of them will be, occur more than once in a, in a program, but they only, they show up, I will repeat here. Um, um, so th these are the names of the other, of the, the different example programs. And and if I, if I then, if I go here and click on that link, it opens up a window and that's where I'm looking at my, um, this particular charts program, nested donuts, and come down here and somewhere with it line. Here we go. That was the that's the match there. So yeah, if you like, if you wanted to steal bits of code out of here, you can. Uh, and one thing I'll, I'll just demo with this. Um, before I couldn't zoom things in. I think if I go uh, control shift plus yeah I, I zoom in and minus I zoom out um, I think uh, oh that's the um, a reset to control the fold hmm? control zero control zero is um, a reset to zero yeah and in fact it on here it also does uh, I can zoom that in and out Okay, so um, that's doing, um, yeah, just looking through, you just put in um, some character string and it will look through the example programs to see whether there's anything that can help. And then if we go over here, um, these are the, the sample programs and that's um, that little ball going around and around a ring. Um, and what to notice is in the background, the code is hasn't changed. Right, it's still that example. But as soon as I kill this off, it, it displays it displays the code that that was um, for a simple three D pi. Okay, and it starts with a copyright thing, and then it's got um, there's, there's the code there. And if we go down, then I look at what's in that example directory there and uh, um, yeah it displays it um, if we look at charts we could go to audio example hello yeah so um, that's a little demo there and again we're still looking at the um, what's it? the simple 3d one we haven't switched to audio but as soon as I kill it off Boom, it changes to the audio one. Is it a bug in the Yeah, we, we look at that one later on. <laughs> so, I haven't worked that one out yet. We've spent a lot of time trying. Um, okay, so that's the code for it. And uh, these are the files to do with the audio. Um, yeah, so later on, Lawrence, we, we can look. Well, do we want to see nested donuts? Here's nested donuts for you. Yeah. I, I, can't quite understand how you make sense of it, but it seems to work. I don't quite get the hang of that. Does that makes sense. Making, making use of a 2D space in a 2D fashion, which is. And the tough T won't come along and say tough, tough in the view but Because, mm. you know, pie charts, normal pie charts are just one dimensional input of two dimensional space. 
and that's uh, that, uh, mm. so anyway. the taste to another level, even less useful. <laughs> it's showing two two dimensions in a two dimensional space, so mm. it, there is some sense to this. Mm. Okay, so that's this. I think there's a there's about two hundred, I think. Uh, different programs. Um, I don't know. Some of them are simple. Some are, yeah, that's pretty simple. No, I don't think it does much. Yeah. See, that's um, an example of in the waste of space because you're using the 2D area to show just one and right. Yeah. And that's another waste of space. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Being able to see yeah. two dimensions of art in 2D. I think. One of these uses NumPy, and the other one uses yeah. This this is the hack. What can you you can do? Is that the sine x or the x sine x or sine hold on? Somewhere. Yeah, this is square root of sine, isn't it? Is it what it claims? Oh, okay. And then one of these is meant to show, oh yeah, you can make it go get eaten into the wall or eaten into the back wall. Can you rotate it by dragging within the display? No, that seems no. like shift. What? Oh, shift. I can zoom in and out. Um, so no, no middle mouse opening. So you can click to... Oh, there we go. Oh, there you go, there you go. And you can it. <laughs> no. And it's so, it's so. And so what are you using? Uh, right mouse. Oh, right mouse. Um, somehow it makes it colourful. Oh, there we go. Oh, there you go. Yeah. That one. Yeah. Okay, so there's some. Kind of groovy little things you can play around with. Um, performance? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think this is. Oh, that's the code for it. Oh, Did it switch as soon as you switched windows? You no, have to close it. Still not. Still not until I close it off. There it is now. Oh. And um, in that case, it had a main dot pi, which is this the main? Oh, yeah. I wasn't expecting it to contain much. Um, often I have a main. See, this has got a, a separate, a separate, a separate file for the surface graphic. So, so that I put in anything that ends in pi, but isn't to do with, um, you know, resource file. So, uh, and this contained um, should be two pi for the main pi and the surface graph pi. I display those plus, okay, the mountain PNG that you use as well. There's um, other images there. Okay, so. Uh, that's about it, I think. And so, oh, yeah, I better show you the bugs. <laughs> yeah. So, what did you do for syntax highlighting? Oh, yeah, for syntax highlighting, oh, that's, it's in my next little presentation. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I'll show you that. Um, okay, so so now what? What? I didn't. Okay, um, next bit. Um, okay, for importing. With, this is with regard to the little program I've written. Um, uh, well, I, I, I should mention that I also wrote this and displayed something a lot simpler, but it was a Python help, and I also did a bash help similar to that. And <clears throat> I've done a PyQt6. No, no, that should say uh, PyGTK6, uh, 4, sorry. Yeah, whoops. Yeah, so I, I also did one for... I think I did, GTK4. Um, anyway, when, when I run this program, so that the DIR function works and I can get all the classes and get all the um, methods and stuff, I have to um, do perhaps a little bit non standard sort of importing. So, the normal way you're expected to import with uh, PySide 6 is you go PySide 6. QT core import, say QDate or something like that. Why is that? Yeah, because you know, if you Python supports different styles, I would use because. That's right. Yeah. It, it is okay to do this. I mean, that's just shortening. That's fine. I use that too. Yeah. 
Um, and I might use a shorter name, like, I don't know, iSci 6.qt4 as qt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, then you can say qt. If there was a way to get rid of the Q and then run the class names, you know, then qt.class, qt.date, and all that, that'd be even better. I think one thing, I don't think we've got a slide on it, but I'll mention it while I think of it is, it was pretty smart of these guys to come up with the idea that all their naming convention would be cute, start with the letter Q. Because if you go Google, probably the, the, the least used letter in the alphabet, would, well, one of them would be Q. Uh, has that changed since 2016 and the rise of um, QMO? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I just wonder. Well, yeah, there's that Quentin. Yeah, on Facebook, so it's a wall there is also that, you know, that splatter movie guy, Quentin Tarantino, QT. <laughs> is it? Yeah. No, There's one called Smile. I don't know who it is. No, Pulp Fiction and all that sort of stuff. And that, he's, he's QT. Is but, he all right, his initials. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So you get him. But otherwise, it, it is quite. You, you, Google will give you some fairly good hits because there's not much there to confuse it, you know. Um, so whoever picked QT was, was on a good thing. But anyway, I would say that the, the way I import it is to do import um, PySide 6 QT core as QT core. And then, then I can do a, a DIR of QT core and get all the classes, right? Um, where, yeah, DIR QT core, where it's, um, and then to get all the attributes or whatever, then I can go QT core dot class. So I can go DIR QT core dot Q date, for example, and get all the, the other bits. And uh, the total thing is there's 46 modules. Comes out the total classes off those 46 modules is you know, 1,296. And then all the attributes is over 100,000. Um, a lot of them would be repeated. Uh, uh, and I've already taken out all the double underscore ones. I've taken out about 30,000. So, so there's um, you know, a lot of attributes out there. Um, and anyway, moving on, what have we got here? Um, oh, one of the things with the way my code works is I build the, the dictionary um, down here because I've got a, um, I've done all those imports uh, and I've got the 46 modules so my module list is dir that um, and then then i call my little routine here pass the module list to it and um, create a dictionary and then look for anything that starts with qt because all modules start with qt and start building a dictionary i then um, by using this dir eval module that gives me a list of all the classes for that particular module. So I build a, a sub-dictionary, uh, no, no, I just hang on to that. And then, then I wanna be able to get the, the um, methods off that class. And so I have to build a bit of a string and pass that to DIR again. And that, that gives me my subgroup. Okay, and that's my, everything's in a dictionary. And by having it as like a dictionary within a dictionary that contains a list, then, um, when I want to build that tree, it's fairly easy. I just pass, here's my dictionary here getting passed to a, um, a tree widget, isn't it? Um, what's it called? We're, we're using eval instead of get attribute. So you just run two things with the dot and then you value eval. Yeah, you just get attribute. That's what get attribute is for. Oh. Okay. You know, avoid eval when you can. Yeah. You know, yeah. All right. So, yeah, eval has all kinds of problems. Mm -hmm. It's okay for arbitrary code. Yeah. And then also you can constrain that by saying eval within this namespace. Mm -hmm. So so what when I go? DIR so get at module method list equals DIR and instead of get module subgroup string, instead of eval module subgroup string, you get error of module comma subgroup. Mm -hmm. You know, shall I I'll do it after. I'll do it after. Yeah. I'll just oh, I have not even finished anyway. So. Um, done a few more slides. Okay, so that's something to fix up. Um, yeah, so this is um, taking a dictionary and basically the top key, which is the module, um, becomes the parent, and then the uh, the class is, is extracted and become I call that the child, and then the grandchild is um, the methods. Really. So it 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 puts a Python dictionary quite nicely into a um, 
the, the widget called Q Q tree Q tree widget item. Yeah. Um, one of the other things I used again, which I seem to end up at some point using, and this is what I call my reverse pop. So I, I want to go through a list and um, remove things. I've got a list of Python files. However, some of them start with um, RC underscore and some of them end in, in minus RC. So that's in the file name. Um, and, and I don't really want to keep them on my list. So the way I do it is I, I go through the list in reverse, I've already got the length of it, and, and when I get a match, then length minus one minus the index and pop it. Um, if I try and do it going forwards, then it's like pulling the rug out from under your feet. You, you will skip one. Are you sure you want to use in rather than starts with and ends with? I get the feeling you want to start. No, because it's, um, it, it could be, the file name will be uh, underscore rc dot pi, or it could say, Start with RC. Yeah, I suppose I could. Start with for that. You could have arc RC mm. underscore something, maybe? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. oh, it's okay. It's, it's weird. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So so it's it's nice with it or ends with is probably safer. Mm. You might miss. Yeah, it means I'd have to um, cut the pi off the end of the. I'd have to get my yeah, file the name without the pi. Yeah, I mean, yes. it doesn't have. Yeah. Um, so well, I could put next. underscore rc dot p one, or starts with mm -hmm. yeah. rc yeah. underscore. Yeah. yeah, that might be better. Yeah. Okay, well, bit of yes. homework. And then, so the enumerate reverse. Yeah, yeah. Reverse. I don't know whether that's. I mean, I can just. I mean, I worked that one out you know, six months ago, so I, and mm -hmm. I quite often use it. Now, I'm not really sure if there's a better way to do it, but. If, if you, you go forward, forward yeah. huh? well, because okay, because you reverse the list, you're going through the, um, and then you're copying the original list. So you made a copy, you made a reverse copy that you're iterating through, yeah. and then you are popping off the original list. You're always popping the the last mm -hmm. one you found. Mm -hmm. So you've done all the corrections you're from the end yeah. backwards, going backwards to I the mean, beginning. My old fashioned way would be I have index. If I don't pop, I increment. Mm, that's one way. Uh -huh. That's a really simple old fashioned way that I yeah. would use. Yeah. Another way is index in range with a step of negative one. And that would give you the effect that you want. So rather than reversing the file list, yeah. you index mm -hmm. into the actual file list and pop from there. That will work. Because I'm, so yes, I'm, I'm making use of the enumerate, you see, yeah. as my counter rather than have to put a Counting will count plus one or something. Yeah, so you're making a copy of the whole yes. list. If it's a very long list, it's just expensive, I would have thought. Yeah. Uh, and otherwise, you just have a little count. I mean, you, you create a length variable, so it's like having yeah. an index with a numerator and whatnot. So, yeah. I mean, yeah, I've already had to add that line. I just, for, for, I just for, use basic stuff. Yeah. <laughs> for it's the, easier to read. For, for iterating forward, in the way that Peter suggests, then of course you can't use range. So you yeah. need, need a while loop or something because then you might, you might run it to the end. So you've got to compare against the current. Yeah, I think just, yeah, as long as sort of like, um, yes, while loop, yeah, in that case, yeah. Yeah. As long as it's lower than the length, then. Yeah, yeah because if you're going forward and the list is shrinking, then, yeah, the while loop would then you go off the end with it, yeah. yeah. So while, while it's less than length of the end. Yeah. Whereas coming backwards, I'm coming down to zero. Yeah. So okay. how many I throw out or how many yeah, yeah, I don't yeah, doesn't make any difference. It stops when it gets to zero. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's um, one little thing I used. Uh, talking about pigments, this is um, Peter you mentioned. Um, so, so for example, this is a bit of code where I'm, it's a web browser window that I have that it takes HTML, and then all those Python files. Um, for the examples, um, you know, I just look through and I've got a list of all the files in that directory. So the files that end with um, or ends with pi, and um, so you've got your lexa. You've already got a Python lexa you can use. Um, there's various styles. There's about twenty different styles. I'm using GitHub Dark, um, is what you saw before, um, and then you set up the formatter to use 
because I'm going to pass it to a web browser window. I'm going to pass it to an HTML as HTML. So uh, set up the HTML formatter. Um, full equals true means uh, what happens if you don't do that? I can't remember. It wouldn't give me the whole file for some reason. Oh, I forget now. Anyway, that's where I implement the style. Line numbers, I want line numbers down the side. And um, you can also add title, but I found the title, the font size was like H1 or something under HTML. It was way, way too big. So so I, I then open the file um, on this loop and, and um, read, read it in and call it Python code. And then um, I put a heading in H4 size um, and a nice bright green if you like bright green and then um, then I add my I, I say highlight the code um, that's the code there using the Python Lexa and this formatter style and then once I've been through the loop and got all the Python programs then I just say um, uh, web browser um, dot set HTML and bring in the HTML string. So, so the Python Lex and the HTML format are just imported from the pigments? Yeah. Next yeah. Okay. The part of it. Mm -hmm. I'll show you the, um, if we look at the, um, uh, I'll show you the import mm -hmm. at the beginning, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, this, yeah, so this is what it looks like, comes in with that bright green little header mm -hmm. and we, we see a bit of um, Copyright, and then this is the GitHub Dark or whatever it was called. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that's this place to code. And yeah, this is <laughs> here's where I actually add the string. I go with set HTML and, and bring that the HTML string that I've just converted with pigments and add it to the display in the code browser. So that happens first, and then I use subprocess to run the example program. And for, for whatever reason, it does it in the opposite order. The event will, the, obviously, because you're not giving a chance for the event to update. Yeah. Yeah, you must be. Right. But, but I read through it and theoretically refresh. Yeah, but you still have to queue it on the thread that operates the UI. So please do this. And then queue the next thing to do because you might be just pushing it all in and doesn't get a chance to do it. It might be too slow. So I could imagine that the browser set HTML queues something else right. in the thread, and but the run Python program runs first. Okay, the race yes. condition. Yes. So you have like if you wait like a second or something in between. I put oh, I tried it. putting sleep. No, no, no. <laughs> Is there a way to? No, it's just it's just, just testing whether. Yeah, no. I, yeah, I tried. I tried using sleep. I mean, sleep should yeah. allow other things to. No, no, sleep. I'm not sleep. No, that will not. That will not work. Oh, yeah. okay. So I mean, with, if it was async or you could say await async or mm -hmm. just like your run, you could do um, await async or dot some process something rather run that, and of course, as soon as it gets into the await, the event will get to run and it will update immediately. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the other option is typically with, with event loops, there is an explicit run one iteration of the event loop. You know? Uh, so you reckon there's one in QT? Bound to be. Like TK until there is one, I know. Mm. In fact, that's the only way you can run a call there. Mm. So there's bound to be in QT, there's bound to be a way to do that. Yeah. So before doing the run there, do flash off heading updates, okay, now there's this. Yeah. Because yeah. there is this refresh, but that didn't work. And then I tried using sleep and I used this equivalent of um, QT delay or QT time or something like that, but I couldn't yeah, get it. No, nah, nah, so. so that doesn't give, is there a call that, yeah. So, call so, that gives the event loop a chance to run. That's the thing. Because yeah. obviously it waits until your method returns and then it runs yeah. the event loop. Because this doing refresh is what was recommended from Googling, where I could find people. Uh, and people saying, yeah, it solved my problem, but it didn't like, say. In, in GTK, you could also do loop.call soon and do the run that way. Mm. And so that would effectively do queue the run as an idle task, which should run immediately, but first you'll do the events and then mm. you'll do the run. Well, we can have a little play later if you want. 
trying to see, see what I can do. Anyway, that was one of the little problems. Um, oh, I showed you before how I can zoom so, in and zoom out. Oh, you did the control zero and all that now. Okay. Yeah. So, you so control, control plus plus, uh, control minus, uh, control shift plus, and control O and control Q with the close. And um, I tried, at one stage I had it working for the, um, the text edit window that contains all the information. Like I've got two tabs there. And I had one for the HTML stuff with Zoom, and and I had the other one, Zoom, <laughs> and it stopped. And I, mm. I haven't worked out why it stopped. Yeah, it, um, I must confess this program was kind of written as like five separate programs, and I merged it all into one. And, and sometimes things stop when you do that. And uh, uh, yeah, um, another thing. Oh yeah, it's Splitter is the thing that that. Um, um, that, that I'm using. So I create the main window and I put a horizontal splitter in there. And one side had the tabs that you saw and the other side was a, actually a vertical splitter that contained the different searches and run the examples. And you can play with what they call the stretch factor. So in this case, the horizontal, uh, horizontal splitter number zero gets a weighting of four. And the other one, number one, gets a weighting of three. So it made the bigger one, the top one, bigger anyway, than the, the one on the right hand side. And the one on the right hand side is actually four stretch factors, but I give them all the same weighting. Um, and years ago, I remember you could have an icon that was called a splitter handle, and it just showed sort of where to grab. We to take the mouse and grab it, but um, I can't find find that. So um, I couldn't put a handle on the on these things. If we if we go back to my, where's my present? Uh, if I just go back to my code. Uh, I'll just, yeah, see, I can come over here, and then I can I can oh, okay. play with that, and I can also play with this. But but in there there should be like a bunch of little dot oh maybe there are there should be sort of some little dots to indicate this is where you grab a hold of me but um, uh, I, I don't know why you need that anyway as soon as I see a divider like that I'll try to ignore it anyway <laughs> okay. yeah but I like visual cues whether it is yeah. something or not the divider is the visual cue so I mean no to me quite I, I don't want to make this yeah. Invitation to click. You will yeah. offer and click unless you have one other click. Yeah, it's an indicator. Yes, you can actually do something there. Yeah. Right. You, you can't take rejection. You try to get nothing happens if you feel this one. It almost looks like there's five little dots on there. Yeah, right, right. Can you see anything on the screen? Yeah. Dots. You reckon dots? Yeah. So there is a little icon, but it's pretty pathetic. Yeah, maybe if I have. Ah, nothing. We've got to have a look on the screen. I think it's there on the wall. No, Lawrence, have a look here. No. See, do you reckon there's little dots in there? Oh, yes, there is. Oh, yes, there is, yes. Is there three little dots or something? Five little dots. Five and little yeah, dots. there's five dots here. Yes, so, there are, there are. So, okay, so so really what I need to do is play around with a bit of um, CSS and, mm -hmm. and try and make the make it a bit more sexy or something. Make it blue. Could be just the theme of Marte that it's so... You can choose a different theme, knowing that it's there. Yeah. It's at least my guess. It might be just the theming that you have. Right. Okay. Yeah. Oh, you. What would be good is a hover thing. Is that that, that? that you know, as you come over there and hover, then the thing, the little dots turn bright yellow or something. But the whole divider is draggable, isn't it? It's not just like. Yeah. Yeah. I can go anywhere. Yeah, but, but, What's the point of having the dots? The dots would say click here. Yeah. Uh, but it's just sort of saying that, <laughs> that uh, this is a draggable area. Oh, well, that means it's not movable. But the cursor changes as soon as you move the axis. Yeah, yeah okay. that's already a cue. Yeah, but I have to move the mouse pad. Well, you're going and to like you always like to say oh. it's very imprecise moving to a certain location if it's not at the top or the bottom of the screen, right? It's slow. It's slow. So from that point of view, having a visual cue there. 
how to these sort of like deciding should I wait to so you don't spend the effort, okay, uh, I'm not going to bother if it's not going to, okay, there's yeah. going to be an investment return on my time. Yeah, okay. yeah but that's really the only thing. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I was just wondering wh whether I've got a um, async IO example. Mm -hmm. I saw D bus. So I wonder, I wonder how the D bus thing works. Oh, that so does Just coming back to the event loop, yeah. so I had a look. Um, so the Q event loop has a method called process events. Ah. Oh, okay. So you, um, this function is especially useful if you have a long running operation and want to show its progress without allowing user input. Okay. You can do something there. So there's there's multiple flags that you can sort of like supply to the thing. But I don't know, maybe you can run that before you then do the um, other one, the uh, when you're running in Python thingy. So is there an option to just run one iteration of the event? Uh, also maximum time. And it can return sort of like saying yes, we processed all of them or no. So it's no guarantee that you will. Okay. See, the other option is to put the run into some kind of idle class. Mm. Yeah. So, like, equivalent of call soon. Um, just oh, one thing I said I'd was show you. Like put was... it on the QT loop or send event or something. Can you, can the methods be AC to death nowadays? I don't know. So I don't know. Mm. Is that, that would be, you know. Here's, here's the pigment thing, Peter. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I had from pigments, I'm mm -hmm. formatter and highlight, pigments lexa, Python oh, yeah. lexa, yeah. Oh, cool. HTML formatter. And mm -hmm. I don't think I actually I import this get style by name, but in the end, I may not have used it. Okay. Yeah. I thought you were using the GitHub yeah. 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 I saw that too. To get your style. Ah. There you go. Uh, get style by name. Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, in fact, I think. The, the very bottom of this, yeah, these are the heads of different styles. So there's quite a few more than. Oh, more than that. <laughs> <laughs> GitHub Dark was what I was using, but yeah, you can. Algol. Hmm? Yeah, Algol. Is that the language or the style? Oh, language, I guess. Because the, the uh, name of the style comes from Arabic, it means the demon. Oh, right. Yeah, algol, the algorithm language. Um, algorithm language. But the demon, because it was the first variable style that you could spell. Algol, the response to Fortran, to be more mathematical? Not sure whether it's a response to Fortran, but certainly it was around a similar time. Lots of languages being developed. So algol was the, the computer scientist's mm. idea of how to do things. Right, uh, and engineering. Yeah, and also, they had all these theoretical ideas, but had no idea how to implement them. <laughs> because there are lots of things in Algol. Some of them turned out to be, it really drove language implementation. Mm. Because there were things in there that also that were not clearly specified. Mm. Like they introduced the idea of local variables and asset local variables. Mm. And they had this thing called own. So own was a way, normally local variables go away when the function terminates. So own says keep this. Until next time I come back, I want to still have a very last time. Mm. So then the question is, well, what's the starting value? They forgot to have an initialization. So what is this? Is it static? Is it local but to an outer scope? They didn't specify. So there were a lot, all these things in Algo. Mm. The original spec was 50, 60 pages or something. You know? And uh, and call by name was the notorious one. You, you know that... Um, uh, yeah. Oh, that's your Algo. It's all in black and white, and um, mm -hmm. bit of bit of um, italics, underlining, yeah, okay. but no color. Black and white printer friendly. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. So, yeah, you can. Okay. Anyway, thanks. Yeah. So I think mm -hmm. that's kind of it. We don't want to hold other people up. Do we? I mean, oh, awesome. unless anyone's got any questions. Like, yeah. First of all, thanks, Ian. You're welcome. Yeah. Um, any questions from the audience? No, I'll put my I'm curious to know what the DBus example looks like. Maybe that'll give us a clue about them. Well, one obvious thing is if they allowed any method to be async dev, that would give a very easy hook into uh, 
uh, Ipsicado. So any method that was called on, on the GUI, uh, it, it should be possible for the for the event loop to transcribe to recognize that what it, what fact was a coroutine object. And that means that, okay, so and then within there you can do a weight and whatnot. That would be the easiest way to integrate Ipsicado into an event loop. Was it Yeah, but oh, maybe list name. And either one. What does it look like? Okay, so it runs. What does the code look like? Uh, so that works. But how is it implemented? What does the code look like? Uh, okay. Yeah, I'm curious. Here. No async def anyway? None. So that's completely synchronous. Mm. Oh, that's boring. Mm, no, no, no. There's, there seems to be a tool called QAsync. There's a package called Quamash. Or Quamash, don't know what. And that's an async IO wrapper around QT. That's separate. Right. Okay, so there's a server there. Yeah, but this is not a GUI demo. Mm -hmm. and, and I really have to run two apps. <laughs> I can't get that one to go. Yeah. So I don't know whether that will allow me to look at the. Yeah, so that, that thing that I came just across QA sync allows coroutines to be used with PyQT. So it's a separate extra thing. Yeah. So QA sync, which is separate, is a fork of async QT, and which is a fork of Kamash. Oh, okay. So man, it's longer than its predecessors. <laughs> um, last update QA eight months ago. So what happens with Kamash then? Is it being neglected or what? Okay. Yeah, here's the yep. ping and pong code, but uh, That's no async in there. Four years ago, last one. Export all sources. That's the pong source. one, I think, and the ping one is up here. So you've got to call routines to define. So how do you define your your dbus methods? Dbus interface, service name, create that argument, arguments like call. So that's a client service name session bus. Yeah. That's so ping, isn't it? This one? So which is the client? So ping that is like a client. So the other one must be the server. Pong server. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Pong server. So Pong plus Pong P object slot. Ah, see, it uses decorators to define the slots. Now, are those debus specific? Is, it slot, is that a debus specific decorator or is it a kind of a generic QT thing? Can you scroll up? Yeah, the where, yeah, up? yeah where does slot come from? Oh, you know, it's quite, yeah. It looks fairly looking something. Yeah, yeah, well, there's, there's a module QT debus, isn't it? So connect the session bus, register your service. So it's kind of, it needs a number of calls to hook it all together. Mm. So unlike like Pine Bus or mine, I think, which does it with different scope in there. Anyway, so mm -hmm. maybe that's it. I'm going to call it quits. We could. Any questions from the online audience? Thanks, Ian. Oh, okay. David, you're welcome. Oh, I guess I'll, I'll, I will post this code at some point um, on the, um, what will it be? GitHub.com slash WLUG slash today's date. Uh, you mean Hamburg? Uh, Hamburg. Hamburg. <laughs> so, no meaning. Yeah. And we'll post it and also on uh, meetup.com where the link is. 
onto GitHub repos so people will find it. Cool. Awesome. Thanks everyone for coming tonight. Um, and we'll see what we're going to do next month. So if anyone should feel um, courageous, just let me know and um, send me through a little note for your talk. Thank you guys. See you later.